Good morning from Boulder, Colorado, the traditional lands of the Arapaho, Ute, and Cheyenne people. My name is Kristen Carpenter, and I'm a professor of law and director of the American Indian Law Program at the University of Colorado. I also serve as the member from North America of the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Together with my colleague Sue Noe, staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund, and our colleagues at the National Congress of American Indians, I'm pleased to welcome you to our second webinar on Indigenous Peoples and Intellectual Property Issues. These webinars grow out of our work with tribes, tribal leaders, and attorneys participating in negotiations at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, regarding instruments for the protection of traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, and genetic resources. To the extent that some of these conversations are happening far away in Geneva, we wanted to bring the conversation back home to Indian country for more education and dialogue regarding indigenous peoples and intellectual property generally. Our last session featured WIPO staff, along with individuals from the US, and patent, US Patent and Trademark Office and indigenous scholars discussing some of the legal basics of intellectual property law. One of the major issues that arises is how the lifeways and concerns of indigenous peoples both reflect, but sometimes challenge existing legal categories in international and domestic law and what to do about that in various institutions. Important components include the assertion of rights as well as negotiation and dialogue and attention to indigenous people's own laws, customs and traditions in these areas. Today, we turn to a deeper focus on matters in the United States. We are joined by an all-star lineup. First, Ms. Susan Anthony, the tribal liaison to the US Patent and Trademark Office, along with Mr. Ken Van Way from the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. We'll discuss federal law and programs for traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. Next, Professor Susan Scafidi of the Fashion Law Institute at Fordham will present a case study involving the Navajo Nation and urban outfitters. Finally, Professor Jane Anderson from NYU, who will present research produced together with her colleague Maui Hudson, will share with us some of her research on Indigenous people's own initiatives for the protection of traditional knowledge. On that panel, she'll be joined by Ms. Lisa Moorhead Hillman from the Karuk tribe, who will discuss um, complementary material from her own experience as a cultural practitioner. We have reserved some time at the end of the program for discussion, and so we invite the audience to submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. Sue Noe will po pose some of those questions to our panel for discussion as time allows. And you're welcome to direct them to specific um, panelists or to the group as a whole. Finally, this endeavor on indigenous peoples and intellectual property law coincides with the University of Colorado and Native American Rights Fund's project to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the United States. This is a major research and advocacy project with significant opportunities for participation by tribal leaders, scholars, attorneys, students, and others. I invite you to check out our website, which is one of the places we will post the videos from the IP webinars. And going forward, we hope to have some in-person training sessions here in Boulder next year. With that, I will turn it over to Susan Anthony and Ken Van Way. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you so very much. I am delighted to join you today. Unfortunately, I am joined by someone or something I didn't expect, and that was someone who has just decided to mow and blow their lawn. So I do apologize for the background noise. I'd like to begin um, our portion of the program with a brief overview of U.S. intellectual property, well known to some of you, but perhaps not to all of you. Uh, first, we have patents, which is a government grant by each government in the world. Uh, but one of the challenges for protecting traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression, which is what we're here to discuss, is that such um, information or such items may not meet the standards of patentability. And also, uh, obtaining a patent is very time sensitive, which often would disqualify uh, patent protection for TK or TCEs. 
For those of you who would like to know more about patents, uh, we do have information on the USPTO.gov website on the patent pro bono program. So if you meet certain financial standards, you would be able to have access to free legal services to uh, apply for a patent. Copyright too has its challenges for TK and TCE. Uh, copyright typically requires identification of specific authors. Uh, it, it requires, at least within the U.S., fixation, and there are many examples of TCEs for um, storytelling is one that comes to mind, oral storytelling, which would not meet the fixation standard. And then again, uh, term is a challenge because patents and copyright do not last forever. Trade secret is another means of protection, but whether that would apply to TK uh, is uh, an open question because the meaning or definition of trade secret is confidential this information that has economic value because it is not generally known and because steps have been taken to keep it secret. Uh, I doubt that uh, many nations would think of uh, traditional knowledge as falling within that definition. The last is trademarks, and I tend to think that's where the action is, so we'll both at the beginning of this uh, sec session and at the end. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office maintains a system for recognizing and registering those uh, private property rights that are capable of functioning and are used as commercial source identifiers. Uh, that might sound like a lot of government gobbledygook, so I'll just make it plain and simple. It's a source identifier. And I began this morning with my Folgers coffee, and I'm going to partake of my Coca-Cola soda when I am done speaking. So we do have some uh, challenges, though, in attempting to defend cultural heritage or identity from being appropriated within the USPTO. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Washington football team cases in which the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board at the USPTO uh, canceled certain trademark registrations on the grounds that they were disparaging. But for those of you who follow the Supreme Court decisions, you may be aware that the ability to um, determine that a potential uh, registered mark is disparaging was struck down in TAM, uh, also known popularly as the Slants case. And the ability to um, refuse a registration for a mark on the grounds that it is immoral or scandalous was struck down uh, in the Supreme Court case of Brunetti. So what do we have left? Do we have anything left? Yes, actually, we do have quite a bit left. Uh, the USPTO is very, very concerned in evaluating uh, applications for federal registration that a mark um, for registration is not deceptive. And we have several sections of the Lanham Trademark Act, which is what we administer, that go to deception. So we, we still have some tools. In addition, the USPTO manages the Native American Tribal Insignia Database. Now, that may not be familiar to you. As a matter of fact, after 20 years, I am dismayed to say that we only have 71 recordations of official tribal insignia in that database. And that's 71 recordations by uh, a fewer number of tribes because obviously uh, many nations have multiple official insignia and some of those nations have obviously insignia. And what the, what the Tribal Insignia Database does is it helps the examining trademark attorneys in determining whether a proposed uh, mark for federal registration in any way is confusingly similar to, uh, that is, conflicts with uh, the insignia that is. So it's a very useful tool, but as I say, people either don't know about it or haven't availed themselves of it, and yet it is a free tool. But another useful tool, very useful tool, is the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And so for a discussion of the ICA, I would turn to my uh, friend and colleague, Ken Van Way. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Ken Van Way. I am a program specialist at the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, which is an agency within the U.S. Department of the Interior. 
We were established in 1935 by Congress to promote the economic development of American Indians and Alaska Natives through the expansion of the Indian Arts and Crafts Market. And since the, especially since the passage of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990, a major focus of the board and certainly of the central office where I work is on the uh, enforcement and the implementation of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So just to, to give a, a broad overview on that, the act, as I said, is a truth and marketing law for the sale of arts and crafts in the United States as Indian made, an art or craft product that's, am I talking too fast? Okay, uh, an art or craft product that's uh, offered for sale in the United States as Indian, Native American, or the product of a particular Indian tribe, or even of a particular Indian artist, needs to actually be made by whoever people are saying that is. So for purposes of the act, an Indian tribe is a federally recognized Indian tribe, a, an officially state recognized Indian tribe, and also an Alaska Native Corporation established under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Uh, there's also a provision under the act to allow a tribe to certify a non-member Indian artisan who is a, a lineal descendant of that tribe but unable to be enrolled somehow. The tribal governing body or somebody that they designate like a, a tribal heritage commission or the, the, the cultural preservation office can uh, issue a, a certification letter to somebody as a non-member Indian artisan. So those are sort of the, the broad strokes there for the act. Uh, we have been involved with, with a lot of enforcement. Uh, we've definitely been getting a little bit of press lately, which is nice. Uh, after the 2010 amendments to the act passed, uh, allowing any federal law enforcement officer to investigate act cases, we established uh, an agreement with Fish and Wildlife Service to perform investigations. So the board receives complaints about violations of the act. We resolve a lot of those administratively or work with other organizations uh, like eBay or Amazon or whoever has the platform if people are doing stuff through that. Uh, and then we have the ability to work with Fish and Wildlife Service to do criminal investigations as well. And since 2007, there have been 14 convictions under the act, including uh, four within the last month. There are also civil provisions of under the act, uh, which uh, Susan will talk about, I believe, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that allow an Indian tribe, an Indian arts and crafts organization, an individual Indian artist, or the attorney general on behalf of any of those groups or individuals to bring a civil suit for a violation of the act as well. And the board, the board was involved with one, one move towards a civil suit uh, against Pendleton a few years ago, but that ended in a, a out of court. We didn't even go to court on it. We uh, had a, a settlement with them to give $40,000 ish to the, uh, Red Cloud Heritage Center in uh, South Dakota. Uh, so it's not just the board to beyond the uh, Federal Arts and Crafts Act, 14 states have their own state laws for the sale of Indian arts and crafts. Some of those are, are fairly restrictive and have requirements beyond what the federal act would have. And some of them are, have conflicting provisions. So when the individual state that you're in and interested in, you would really need to check with that. Uh, Alaska has a silver hand program, which is a, a promotional program that they have that does have attached criminal penalties for misusing it, which is a certification mark issued by the state to Alaska native artists. And I guess Susan and I have, have talked back and forth about 
different solutions. And one of the things that we're really interested in is in branding. And we'll, we'll circle back to this a little bit as sort of our, our, our core next steps. But certainly uh, some of the states, like as I mentioned, Alaska and Montana has a native made in Montana program that serve as an extra signifier of the, the native products. Um, also some tribes like the Chickasaw Nation, the Choctaw Nation, and the Central Council of Tlingit and Haida Tribes of Alaska have their own marks and their own certifications that they use with their tribal artists. <clears throat> and with regard to cultural appropriation, a lot of Indian Arts and Crafts Act violations are what we would call consider falling under cultural appropriation. But not all cultural appropriation is an Indian Art or Craft Act violation. So the, the is that there be an art or craft product for sale, or that it be sold as Indian or of a particular Indian tribe or individual Indian, and that not be a true statement. So there are a lot of things that are annoying and so that people might want to see addressed that, that fall outside of the act and we, we do receive complaints about those and try to work with people to find appropriate parties to work with to resolve those. And Susan, do you have anything? I, I have a question for you, Ken. Okay. Uh, a common misunderstanding, uh, at least that I have encountered in my work in the field, is on what one can say about uh, an art and craft, whether uh, traditional or contemporary. Uh, many people will refer to uh, jewelry, for example, or an article of clothing, for example, as Indian style. Is that permissible? Yes. Uh, the uh, Under the regulations, we prohibit the uh, unqualified use of the terms Native American, uh, all those other, uh, something like Southwestern style, Native American inspired, Navajo style, things like that are considered to be qualified language. A lot of what we try and do is to also educate the consumers through our, our consumer brochures and our educational campaigns that just because something looks like an Indian product doesn't carry with it the automatic assumption that it is, that you really need to, to do follow-up questions and you can't just assume because it's got silver and turquoise that it's Navajo. It's a very perplexing uh, area. Uh, recently, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which was uh, one of the uh, speakers in this, in the first of these two webinars, uh, talked about uh, in a in a recent uh, event that they did talked about uh, intellectual property for uh, entrepreneurs in um, in uh, this area, and. I raised the question of the Kawashan pattern. Uh, as somebody who is involved in fiber arts, I was very concerned about the number of knitting patterns that I have seen that, that basically replicate the Kawashan pattern of, uh, that is reflected in the legitimate Kawashan knitted sweaters. And I have found this rather disturbing. So I was hoping the people in the other WIPO program uh, would have a brilliant idea about how to solve this problem. And uh, the speaker said, I think we need education. And I thought that was very interesting because people often replicate uh, Native American works out of a sense of uh, that it is a tribute. And so this leads us into a discussion of cultural appreciation versus cultural appropriation versus cultural diffusion. And in that regard, in preparing for today, I did, um, well, I continually do reading on the subject. And I find that Michael Twitty is a particularly uh, interesting and provocative writer and speaker. He is an African-American uh, Jewish culinary historian 
who has talked about how uh, we have for so long ignored the contribution of African Americans and the enslaved peoples in the cuisine that so many of us enjoy today. And he talked about cultural diffusion as a natural process where he said multiple different cultures live close to one another and can't help but rub off on one another. And he said, that's, that's all right, no guilt, no shame. But he said, when we're talking about cultural appropriation, we're talking about exploitation, abuse, and theft. And I find in my readings on the subject that this more often comes up um, in the area of fashion, for example. Um, and certainly our files, yours and mine, ha are replete with instances where uh, traditional arts and crafts have been appropriated. And so is the question, is it a diffusion? Is it an inspiration? Or is it a taking? And I think the question often turns on uh, who does the taking in my readings. And so as we've looked at the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, and as we've looked at trying to uh, do more with, with the tools that we have, one of the initiatives that Ken and I have developed is in the area of branding. Um, he is the expert on the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. I am not. But we felt in looking at it that what was missing is we can protect against people's use of, of tribal names, but we cannot protect against their copying, their appropriation, if you will, of the traditional uh, arts and crafts. And so we were trying to figure out, is there something more that we can do? And that's why I started off my presentation with, I think, branding is where it is, because what we've been trying to do is to get out to talk to tribal nations about um, using certification and collective marks to help promote and protect the visibility um, to protect and promote the visibility of traditional and contemporary arts and crafts. And so uh, we would certainly be open to, to questions uh, about that um, after the event, if anybody uh, is interested and wishes to pursue this. But perhaps, Ken, you could say a bit more about your vision here. Well, as has been discussed by, by any number of speakers any number of times, as it stands, a lot of these modes of expression are not covered by the contemporary property laws in the United States, bearing in mind that I'm a folklorist, not an attorney. Uh, so to, to my point of view, and certainly in discussion with Susan, <clears throat> having an extra signifier or some additional point of value or validation provided by a tribe or by a, an arts and crafts organization to arts and crafts products will help in the marketplace to differentiate between the copies of the authentic work. And that as a federal employee in the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, I have the tools to help me validate whether or not somebody is an Indian as defined by the act, but certainly to decide whether a particular product is exemplifying a particular culture or not. And that might be best left to the representatives of that culture. And by giving the control of a mark of certification or having that rest in the hands of the tribe or of whoever the tribe chooses, to then work with their artists to decide the standards that they're going to apply to how that mark is used is a good way to give the tribes the control over the equipment to the degree that anybody can under current law. There is such a rich heritage of traditional arts and crafts across the tribal nations. And it is, it is very perplexing when it is appropriated. Um, and yet our laws may limit what we can reasonably do, which is why we're very interested in promoting this branding initiative. But we're not alone in our thinking. Uh, I was very excited uh, a couple of years ago to see a, a project between uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, and Japan, uh, and Kenya. And there, uh, the, the uh, women basket makers 
uh, in Kenya who make beautiful, beautiful sisal baskets, um, wanted to, to take this really from a, a part-time hobby is a little dismissive, but they wanted to grow it into a business, into a full-fledged business and be recognized for their work, uh, have con more control over their work and the power that comes from having control, money, and so forth. And so they developed a, a, a collaborative project in which, um, very simply stated, they formed an organization and they, uh, under the laws of Kenya, which don't currently recognize certification marks, but they got a collective mark for uh, Taita baskets. And so it's, it's very much a success story. And I urge those of you who are interested in a similar branding initiative, possibly for your own uh, tribe or a group of, of artists within your tribe to look at the WIPO website. And if you simply look for uh, WIPO, Japan and Kenya, which is kind of an odd combination <laughs> at any one time, uh, you're sure to find the Taita basket makers and to see their exquisite baskets. So I believe that that is all that I have that I had wanted to, to share. Ken, did you have anything more? I don't think so. I believe we've actually come out ahead of our time. And that's a feat when you're sharing the stage. So thank you both for the really thoughtful presentations and the conversation back and forth. Um, it's really nice for those of us out here in the world to know with a little bit more of an inside perspective what's going on in the agencies in DC that are regulating IP because sometimes that's kind of um, opaque to us. And it's nice also just to become further acquainted with both of you so that when we have questions, now we know who to call. Um, with that, I will um, turn it over and I, I hope that we can come back to this theme of branding, which I think you've really raised in a powerful way vis-a-vis um, -vis economic development and, and so on, which certainly is a set of concerns here in entrepreneurship. Um, and perhaps that'll come up as a theme in, in the Q&A. So thank you. Um, with that, I am going to pass the floor to Professor Susan Scafidi from Fordham and the Fashion Institute. And Susan, take it away. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thanks to both you and Sue for the invitation. I am thrilled to be here with the, this very distinguished panel and to be able to listen to you all and speak with you. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen um, and I have a little PowerPoint for you uh, to, to, uh, to follow along today. Um, and we will start it from, we, we will begin at the beginning. Um, so as, as you mentioned earlier, I'm going to give you a little bit of a case study on a case in which I was involved as an expert on behalf of the Navajo Nation. Uh, but first, let me sort of put all of this in context uh, a little bit. And so we start from the place of trying to address a problem that is literally older than the United States, going back to the Boston Tea Party and people uh, dressing up in what they perceived as, as, as a version of native garb. Uh, as, as Susan mentioned, of course, the Washington Redskins, happily, now referred to as the Washington team, uh, not through the years of legal action that were engaged in trying to cancel the trademark, but finally through social pressure and the threat of the loss of a sponsor. Of course, the Cleveland Indians are still out there, and this, is, this shows sort of the, the way in which this kind of perspective of being able to take images or products permeates American culture. And just as a reading recommendation, there was a book that was written just over 20 years ago uh, by Philip Deloria, who is actually uh, now at Harvard um, as their first tenured Native American scholar uh, and uh, th that follows this, this, this trend throughout history. Um, so a little light reading for your spare time. Uh, as Susan mentioned, uh, this is a particularly persistent problem in fashion, uh, whether it is the, the dressing up 
or the actual taking and recreating and selling of product. And to give you just a few examples of that, um, we, ha we can go back to, uh, to 1998 as a starting place uh, from Dior. Uh, so a, a luxury French fashion house, the, the uh, head designer at the time was John Galliano, and he conceived of his fashion show uh, that, that season as, some, as the Diorient Express, a train burst through the, through the backdrop, and he had a, this idea of, 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 of first contact as a fashion moment. Um, and at the time, 1998, social media wasn't around, and so there wasn't the amount of outrage you might expect, although there were a few raised eyebrows because eyebrows still went up and down back in 1998, even in the fashion crowd. Um, a few years later, 2002, Jean-Paul Gaultier called his collection after the Hussars, right? So a, 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 a traditional culture from uh, not, not so traditional, uh, but from, uh, from Europe, actually, but used, again, a Plains Indian headdress, uh, lots of feathers. Victoria's Secret 2012 sent Carly Kloss down the runway in, again, a, a, a Plains Indian headdress um, and, and some traditional silver jewelry, squash blossom, and so forth, um, and, uh, and very little else other than a most incongruous leopard print. Um, Victoria's Secret apologized. Carly Kloss apologized. When that runway show was aired on television, they cut out this portion. So we see a little bit of evolution in, in the social perception of appropriateness. And yet, it comes back again and again. Just a couple of years later, 2014, Pharrell Williams shows up on the cover of Elle magazine dressed like this. Elle magazine, of course, apologized, um, but didn't withdraw the color the cover. It was L-U-K, by the way, not, not the U.S. version of L. From Canada. Um, uh, so D Square, Dean and Dan Caton, uh, sent out the hashtag D Square collection. Lots of questions about the appropriateness of the name and certainly about the appropriate the appropriation of First Peoples culture in Canada. And again, there was an apology. And then we come to Urban Outfitters, um, who decided uh, in 2015, uh, or uh, excuse, uh, excuse me, uh, back a little earlier than that, actually 2011 uh, and 2012, uh, to, to issue a whole series of products uh, using this pattern and to refer to this pattern as Navajo. So we had the Navajo whiskey flask, all kinds of reasons why that's inappropriate. We had Navajo socks and we had everyone's favorite, the Navajo hipster panty. Um, now, Urban Outfitters was not prepared to apologize, but the Navajo Nation took the opportunity to bring a lawsuit against Urban Outfitters and on some of the grounds that Ken and Susan just discussed. So um, this was my reaction, uh, the, the polite version of my reaction. I looked at this and said, because Urban Outfitters that has refused to apologize. Um, they instead said, actually, we think the term Navajo is just generic for a style, right? Um, we, we don't think that the Navajo Nation actually owns that name, at least in the fashion context. This made me furious uh, because we are looking at a history in this country uh, and in many others of taking lives, of taking land, of taking children, and now we want to erase a culture altogether by taking taking it's, it's the creations of the mind and its very name, okay, this is wrong. Uh, it's wrong at an ethical level. I think it is also wrong at a legal level, which is why I agreed to become involved in the case as an expert. All right, and I, I should stop and tell you just a little bit about where I come from and what I've done in, in terms of the focus of my career. A lot of it has been looking at the question of why intellectual property law discriminates at, amongst different forms of creativity. So uh, the book back in 15 years ago in 2005, on this question of cultural appropriation and who owns culture. Um, and then the Fashion Law Institute founded to, to, well, establish the field of fashion law more generally, which didn't exist back when I was in law school. Uh, but where I started from was the intellectual property question. So in this case involving urban outfitters and the use of the name Navajo on these particular products with these particular patterns fell right in at, at the juxtaposition of, of two of the things that I hold most dear. Um, so um, my first question, of course, was 
what legal tools are available? And Susan and Ken have done a beautiful job of explaining that to you, so I won't say much other than to note that uh, the Navajo Nation, of course, looked at the Indian Arts and Crafts Act and at intellectual property laws that might be available uh, to, to, to deal with these, these things. Um, but of course, there's always, when we're dealing in this realm generally, pushback by the, by the First Amendment. I also wanted to note just very briefly that while um, Susan embraces trademark and trademarks can, with apologies to the De Beers Company, a trademark is forever. Trademarks can indeed, if properly uh, registered and renewed, can endure uh, forever. Other forms of intellectual property, copyright and patent, do in, fa in fact expire after a period of time. So it might not necessarily always be the most useful for protecting traditional knowledge or traditional cultural ex expressions that are intended to be passed down and endure from generation to generation. So just to throw out that caveat. So with those li limited legal tools, uh, what, were we, uh, what were we able to do? Now I need to give you the, uh, the disclaimer at this point. I filed four separate reports in this case, none of which I can directly share because they were all filed under seal, but I can tell you what I think um, without revealing any confidential knowledge that I learned in the process. So the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, as Ken noted, um, has a, has, it is intended to protect against a false suggestion uh, that, that the good, and it must be a physical item, in question is the product of, among other things, a particular Indian tribe. All right, so labeling something Navajo sounds like a false suggestion to me. Um, it can, it's so we, we're looking at the, so uh, when, when we look at whether there's a false suggestion, we can look at the name Navajo, but we can also look at other things much the way we would look at, uh, at uh, much the way we would engage the process of determining whether a product was counterfeit in trademark terms. So if Susan were drinking counterfeit Folgers coffee this morning, we'd want to know. And the first thing she would look at is the product itself, right? What about the product suggests that it is in in fact, something that is Indian or, or Native American or Navajo. Um, and we might say, well, it uses this particular pattern, right, uh, that is, is associated with, for, with many years of basket weaving and weaving of textiles. So maybe that pattern is a suggestion. We could also look at the, at the product itself in another way. Is there anything that suggests this isn't, in fact, um, a product of the Navajo Nation, um, and not necessarily, right? Um, just because it's mass produced uh, doesn't mean, in my mind, and I want to come back to Ken on this, that it couldn't possibly be subject to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So we look at the product itself, we look at the labeling, we look at that hang tag affixed to the item that says Navajo, and in this case, the labeling was pretty clear um, in, in, in making that suggestion, even though, again, Urban Outfitters said, oh, but that's just generic. Everybody in fashion refers to patterns like this as Navajo. Hmm, not so much. Um, the question of branding uh, that, that Susan and Ken brought up earlier um, that I would focus on in this context, in this analytical context, in a different way. How does Urban Outfitters brand itself so that a, a consumer walking in and seeing these products uh, might interpret what, what, they, what that consumer is seeing? Well, Urban Outfitters doesn't, the name doesn't tell us very much, but this case wasn't just against Urban Outfitters. Urban Outfitters is part of an enterprise that has two other sister companies uh, that, that, that have retail stores and brands that were also part of the case. Um, and those sister companies are Anthropology and Free Peoples. Now, I would argue that, that the name Anthropology, even though it's not spelled like uh, the, the specialty of our next speaker, um, it's spelled a little differently, it nevertheless has a connotation of going out and studying and, and finding authentic things from other cultures. So if I walk into a store called Anthropology, right, the store is at least trying to suggest an association with that particular dis discipline. I would also say that Free Peoples has some kind of aura around it that might suggest something that is traditional or indigenous. Um, 
So we have the question of branding. Then we look at the merchandising and marketing, right? How is this displayed? What else is it displayed alongside? Um, how, how is it marketed to the public? And all of those things together, particularly since, for example, Urban Outfitters Anthropology carry a limited amount of vintage merchandise to add a, a sort of a flavor to their retail spaces might actually also indicate to, to a customer, to a consumer, that, that there is a, that the these things are associated with the Navajo Nation, authorized by the Navajo Nation, maybe even in fact in Indian Arts and Crafts Act terms, Indian products. Then there's the question of whether or not we are looking at an art or a craft and thus would be a uh, fall under the purview of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And I would love to have more conversation with Ken about this because as someone who is deeply immersed in the fashion industry, um, I would say that pretty much everything that is mass produced is at some point touched by human hands, uh, which is a, another kind of concern in our industry. Fashion is very, very labor intensive. Garment workers are often not well treated for particularly um, when, when they're producing inexpensive merchandise. But if mass-produced merchandise is touched by people's hands, isn't that a craft as well, potentially? And I also want to note, as Ken is well aware, that the act itself does not define a handicraft. It leaves that to the federal regulations, which I would argue are perhaps slightly too restrictive. And yet, in those federal re re regulations describing what might come under the purview of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, there are many different categories of products listed, including things like jewelry and clothing and belts and shoes and hair bags, all of the kinds of things uh, that we might see uh, in the context of a store like Urban Outfitters, or again, its sister stores, Anthropology and, and uh, Free Peoples. Um, so those things taken together would tell me that there may in fact be a false suggestion here um, of, of association with, in this case, the Navajo Nation. Then there's the question of trademark itself. Now, uh, in, in the US, there is a limited degree of, of what is called common law protection that Susan is uh, very much, very, very familiar with, uh, perhaps even more so than I am. That is to say, even if an entity does not register its trademark with, uh, with someone in Susan's office or in, or in, uh, in Susan's agency, I should say, um, there is a limited degree of protection anyway, based on the use of that mark in commerce. Um, in addition, the Navajo Nation happens to have a number of registrations for the word Navajo, for the name Navajo, including in class 25, which is the class that governs uh, or that, that covers uh, clothing, uh, for wear apparel clothing, those sorts of things. Um, so there are actual registrations involved. And I would further argue, uh, cont contra Urban Outfitters, that this trademark has not become generic, that it is not, in fact, merely a fashion code for a pattern like the one you see on, on the uh, clothing item here. Part of the reason that I would argue that it's not generic is I believe that a registration like Navajo, because of the dual action of trademark law and the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, can't become generic. That is to say, if a trademark is canceled, it doesn't mean that nobody can use it. It means that suddenly everybody can use it. Um, uh, but if the trademark Navajo were unfortunately canceled, and it has of course not been, but if it were canceled because it was generic, because it was no longer serving its role as a source indicator for whatever reason, it wouldn't just fall into the public domain, it would still be protected by the limitations of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. That is to say, people couldn't just pick up the name Navajo and start putting it on other things that were arguably arts or crafts. So, uh, so the argument that perhaps the Navajo Nation had not actively policed its trademarks and shut down the fashion industry's generic use of Navajo in many other contexts, including actually by Pendleton, uh, but, but also others. Um, 
does not mean that we have a generic mark, um, and nor, nor could it. Um, if, and if, for those of you unfamiliar with the concept of genericide or a mark becoming generic, um, if you've ever taken an aspirin, uh, you, have, you, you have experienced genericide. Once upon a time, aspirin was a trademark. Now it goes under many brand names. Um, you can understand why Kleenex is always very concerned when someone says, wait, my nose is stuffed up, please pass the Kleenex that would be please pass a facial tissue if you wouldn't mind. Um, so, um, in fact, the Navajo, the, Navajo, the Navajo Nation did police its marks. It's not, and, and, and they, I believe, would not, and that's my opinion, are not vulnerable to genericide. There are also extra legal tools that can be used. Uh, Susan mentioned advertising or branding around authenticity, which I am a very much a proponent of. Of course, branding is the first step. Uh, getting the product out there to the public is the next. There's the question of social media shaming and calling out cultural appropriation extremely effective. You remember all of those apologies I mentioned earlier from Victoria's Secret to Pharrell on down, right? Um, that's not because of a fear of the law. It's because of a fear of Instagram and Twitter and, and angry folks on social media. And that can actually be a very useful tool, bringing the case to that court. Uh, in the context of cultural appropriation, we've seen a fair number of educational campaigns, including this one from Ohio State. They started back in 2012. We're a culture, not a costume, uh, both in the context of native culture and in the context of many other cultures. This was one of a whole series of posters. But what is cultural appropriation? Um, it's a question I have gotten asked often over the years, back in 2005 when I first wrote about it. Um, a lot of people weren't really familiar with the term, although it had been in use in a number of social science disciplines uh, from the 1980s. It had become popular and was used well before that, in fact. Um, and so just as a thumbnail, a quick uh, way of defining it. What I usually say is taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge or cultural expressions from someone else's culture without permission. And I get a lot of pushback on the, what do you mean? Do I have to go and on the knock on somebody's door and ask permission? Well, there are ways of ascertaining whether or not generalized permission has been granted to go and eat in someone's restaurant and, sh and share their cuisine or to wear something that is produced by their culture. Sometimes the permissions are explicit via sale, sometimes they're tacit or quiet. Um, but it involves doing some homework uh, if you are a consumer or a creator looking to be inspired by someone else's culture. Um, so an example of this right, is uh, that is quite recent is from the designer Carolina Herrera um, and they're, they're her creative director, uh, now Wes Gordon, who was accused of cultural appropriation uh, by none other than the um, uh, the, the uh, head of the Mexican Ministry of Culture over this dress and a number of other pieces in the same collection. Is it a Carolina Herrera gown or is it, or is it embroidery from a particular people in a particular region? Um, well, there was no apology in this case, despite a fair amount of, uh, of social media commentary and, uh, and traditional press around this. In fact, what the creative director said is, but I meant it as a tribute. Okay, great, you know, thanks. You all have heard that one before. Um, it is true that this comes from a place of admiration and love, but you know, a tribute is actually something that can be paid. Uh, we, are, we can pay tribute and maybe there should have been some kind of payment in this case. Um, so yes, it's lovely to be appreciated, but it's not necessarily lovely to have the property that is appreciated then taken from you and used in another way that you haven't authorized. That being said, not all borrowing is bad. And um, She's made a reference to Michael Twitty and, and cuisine, which I think is great. I personally kind of like California rolls. Are they sushi? Well, no, not traditionally. Uh, hence the name, California rolls. Are they made in the style of sushi? Yes. 
culture is fluid, cultural culture does evolve. If it didn't, uh, we wouldn't have fusion cuisine and lunch might get boring. Um, so there are forms of permissive appropriation that are perhaps not cultural misappropriation, but merely inspiration. Now, I, now of course, I am not um, of Japanese descent, and, and I do understand that, that it can be very frustrating if you are a sushi chef who is trained for years uh, to see things at the local grocery store in the United States labeled sushi. Um, so it's not a perfect example, but there is a place for that kind of interaction. How can I tell? And how can you tell? How can a creator tell whether something is appropriate, inspiration, or is appropriation? Well, when you are born alliterative, and my name is Susan Scafidi, uh, you become fond of your letter. So my letter is S. Um, and so, at, so I can't, as a scholar studying this, know the details of what any particular culture or people would find offensive. But what I can do is help create a guideline or a rule of thumb, a series of questions to ask. And the questions that I ask are these. What is the source of the inspiration? Are we dealing with a source community that has been historically discriminated against and is still suffering the effects of that discrimination? If so, proceed with caution. What is the significance of what is being borrowed, taken, um, or serving as inspiration? It, it, is it highly significant to the culture? Is it even sacred or secret? Coming back to that trade secrets, secrets question. Um, although again, that is, uh, as Susan mentioned, complicated. Um, if so, proceed with caution. And finally, if you are creating something new based on another culture that inspires you, how similar is your creation? Are you just borrowing a, a, a colorway or a feeling or maybe a silhouette? Or are you copying something in a line for line, stitch for stitch fashion, in which case, again, you might wish to proceed with caution. So. There's a happy ending to the story. Um, and the lawsuit actually settled. Okay, it took over four years to settle, uh, but the settlement was unusual. The terms overall are confidential, but the public announcement of those terms mentioned not only a, an economic settlement, but also an agreement between Urban Outfitters and the Navajo Nation um, that Urban Outfitters would work with the Navajo Nation to promote actual Navajo products. Um, which is terrific, and in fact, something that the that the gentleman who was president of the nation at the time that the lawsuit was commenced, Bill Shelley, had suggested from the beginning. He said, you know, there's a lot of unemployment on the res. Why don't you work with us instead of against us? And so these are just some examples of the, the jewelry that was sold on the Free People website um, and, and in their spaces um, that was actually created by Navajo silversmiths, um, some of whom were unnamed uh, and some of whom were actually named on, on the website. And all of this done in collaboration with the with the uh, Navajo Arts and Crafts Enterprise. Um, so, we, we, uh, so we had one uh, good resolution, right? And the kind of resolution that we'd like to see more of going forward. Um, I, I, I would ask you to, and Susan and I had a little conversation around this case yesterday, watch this space. There is another lawsuit that has actually been brought in, in this area by the Salaska Heritage Institute, and it's been brought against Neiman Marcus over the coat that you see on the right by the brand Alanui, uh, the raven's tail knitted coat. Um, now, the, the Salaska Heritage Institute has alleged that this coat is a pretty darn direct knockoff of the Clinket artist, uh, Kalisna Rizal's discovering the angles of an electrified heart cape. Um, and, and, and that piece, the, the artist is, is deceased, but her heirs still, still have called the copyright in that case. So there's a copyright argument. There is a trademark or Lanham Act argument of false designation of origin. And oh, by the way, there's an argument that even though the name Raven's Tail is not the name of a federally re uh, registered tribe or federally recognized tribe, um, that, that, that word is still a, a source indicator of a particular style of uh, the, the used by the Clinket people and other peoples in the Pacific Northwest, and therefore uh, should be a violation of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So with that, I think I'm just about on time, and thank you all very much. Susan, thank you so much. That was so beautifully presented in terms of the content and the aesthetic. 
um, of the entire presentation. Um, and it really is wonderful to have you here with the expertise from fashion law, because even some of the you know, nuanced terminology, I think, has sometimes escaped us and really, you know, breaking it down from branding to merchandising to marketing and the different stages of, um, well, action and potential violations and remedies, um, I, th I think is interesting. And this question of remedies is just fascinating. You know, what, if these violations are occurring, well, of course, we'd like to pre prevent them in the first place. Um, but what do constitute remedies in terms of making inter parties whole, restoring relationships, and perhaps um, promoting better um, representations and opportunities in the future, I think um, is a really interesting point and maybe one that we'll pick up on in the Q&A too. Um, I wanted to mention and just remind everybody before I turn it over to Jane and Lisa that um, if you do have questions or themes that you'd like us to raise in the Q&A, please do feel free to um, put those in the Q&A function and we will um, consider them for the conversation after the um, presenters. With that, I will turn it over to um, Jane Anderson and Lisa Moorhead um, to take it from here with respect to Indigenous Peoples' Own Initiatives. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jane Anderson. I, can you hear me? Great. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. I want to um, begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Lenape Hoking from New York. I um, want to pay my respects to the ancestors and to the past, present and emerging leaders. Uh, I am going to take us in a different direction. I hope that um, it, it will be um, a compliment to uh, the speakers that have been before me. Um, I'm thrilled to be on this panel and thank you so much for the invitation and also especially to be sharing it with Lisa. Um, I'm going to take us to kind of more archives, libraries and museums and the different kinds of uh, problems that Indigenous communities experience in these contexts. Um, uh, just as a way of background, I have a background in IP law and uh, have spent about 20 years working with communities in the US, Canada, Australia and more recently in New Zealand. Uh, so I, what I want to talk to you about is a kind of initiative, it's a non-legal uh, initiative, uh, really arising from kind of frustration and limitations that exist within the current law um, around specific Indigenous concerns about uses of works that can't be addressed by copyright and can't be addressed in other kind of areas of IP law either. So I'm going to take us into archives, libraries and museums and also digital infrastructures and data. Um, they're the kind of primary areas where these problems of appropriation of Indigenous knowledge, use of Indigenous knowledge without permission persist. So these are just some of the problems that uh, have kind of been uh, behind the development of this particular initiative and largely that it, it's that every Indigenous community has enormous collections of cultural heritage within museums, archives, libraries, um, universities and data repositories around the world. And Partly the challenge that we have with these collections is that significant information about them, about community names, about the content, uh, about proper provenance is, is missing. It was just never recorded at the time um, that these kinds of pro projects of extraction or extra extractive research were conducted on Indigenous lands. And that also means that Indigenous communities are largely not the legal rights holders, so couldn't use copyright, uh, even if they wanted to. They've already been excluded from that area of law. Um, but these kinds of issues of responsibility and um, the incomplete uh, and mistakes that are in this, this, these collections continue as this material gets digitized, continues as it kind of becomes, turns into, into, um, into the digital lives of these materials. So the problems and mistakes in, go into the metadata. Um, and then on top of that, there are even more researchers working and collecting data and samples from indigenous lands and waters than ever before. So these all present a particular kind of problematic that intellectual property law doesn't necessarily get at, yet remain foundational problems for Indigenous communities. Um, so we, so this is a project that has, uh, is about 10 years old now. Uh, it, it began um, understanding that l there wasn't really a way of developing particular license frameworks for um, traditional knowledge, given this problem of uh, Indigenous communities not owning their cultural heritage within institutions. And so we started a different kind of initiative around labelling. 
Um, and really these should be understood as kind of uh, uh, cultural protocols for sharing knowledge within digital environments. Uh, they're machine readable and they really work to enhance existing metadata within institutional contexts. There's 18 of these cultural, of these labels, of these traditional knowledge labels. I'm going to just going to talk you through a couple of them. Um, this is the attribution label. This uh, is a label that we developed to bring Indigenous communities' names back into the record, back into the archive, back into the library. Um, and, it's, and it's often the first label that Indigenous communities develop in order to kind of correct or uh, fix mistakes that are in these, um, in these contexts. Uh, and what's important to know about the, the labelling system is that the icon that you can see uh, remains the same, but every community is able to uh, customise these labels how they want to do that, um, which is a very important kind of sovereign dimension of how these labels function. And this is just an example of what I mean by that. This is a label that was developed by the Scowlitz uh, Band of the Stolo First Nation in British Columbia. This is the attribution label that they're using for their uh, virtual museum, which is really telling the story of archaeology within their community. And you can really see that they've um, uh, customised the label and really transformed the idea of what attribution means within their own context to literally mean name and place. And within the kind of customization of this label, you really see why uh, the, the Scowlets are using this label, not only uh, because of the history of um, not being their history not being told properly but also to recognize that they are the holders and caretakers of their lands resources and histories um, and that they have responsibilities and obligations to make sure that, that history is told correctly this is a seasonal label and in many ways we're, we're because we're able to maneuver around the limitations of the law we're able to get at a, a range of different kinds of um, cultural concerns around the sharing of knowledge. Um, this is a seasonal label. This allows us to connect knowledge to place, to land. We know that these things are deeply related, but the law doesn't recognize them as deeply related. In fact, Euro-American law seeks to segment and separate them. Um, so this is, a, this is a label that connects um, uh, place to knowledge and it can do that in the, in, in the archive and it does that by adding this label can tell you a lot more about a particular kind of song. For instance, that it should only be sung at a particular time of the year, it should only be sung after the first snow, that it shouldn't be listened to at a particular time of the year. And this labeling system starts to um, add Indigenous control and authority back into the records in ways that should always have been there in the first place. This is the culturally sensitive label. We do have a secret sacred label for um, materials that are of a secret sacred nature. Um, this is that's a particularly important label, particularly for photographs, songs, sound recordings, um, field notes that uh, represent or have representation of um, of ancestors or of uh, belongings that have uh, that that are not subject to NAGPRA. Uh, but this label is a little bit different. This does a little bit of different work and, and it was developed partly because communities were really speaking to the sensitivity of materials that's in archives that people just have no idea about. In particular, this was developed around sensitivities around language materials, understanding that communities have very complex histories around language and where their language materials are. In this instance, it was developed by a community who doesn't own any of their language materials. They're owned by the researcher who documented their language and are held in an archive hundreds of kilometres away from the community. And this community wanted to make sure that they had this label on those collections so that any user of those collections would know how sensitive they are and how they need, how they need to be consulting with the community in the first instance. Um, we have other communities that use this label uh, for census records, for instance, uh, that have derogatory uh, language around it written by the BIA agents um, over these historical periods of time. Um, so this label does a lot of work to kind of speak to the care and the sense sensitivity that might exist in materials that is otherwise not recorded or, um, or made visible. 
So I just want to talk you through one example of how the labels have been used within the Library of Congress um, with the Passamaquoddy uh, uh, wax cylinders. These uh, were and are uh, 31 wax cylinders that were made in 1890. They're the first uh, uh, sound recordings that were made on Indigenous lands in the United States. Uh, they were not returned to the Passamaquoddy until the 1970s and when they were returned in the 1970s they, the sound quality was very very poor and whilst the Passamaquoddy were very excited to have them home and to be able to listen to their ancestors for the first time in 80 years they were unable to hear really what was on those recordings. So the Library of Congress in 2015 started a different kind of project of return but as part of that project of return it also meant dealing with the um, online catalogue record so you can look at this record and what you can see from this is that it's a deeply impoverished record there is no information about the content it is only information about the technology we know how long the recordings are we know a little bit about the name of the song but it's not in Passamaquoddy um, and we know um, about the cylinders we know nothing about the content and I would say this is actually the case for the majority of Indigenous collections, um, partly because Indigenous people have not been involved in, um, in, 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 in collaboration around sharing uh, knowledge that might be in, the, in these collections. This is what the um, uh, record looks like now at the Library of Congress after enormous amounts of work with the Passamaquoddy community. There are there's pages more of information here. Importantly, that the Passamaquoddy have given their consent to share. Um, this was a very important component of the, of the work was what does the Passamaquoddy want to share with the public? Um, and you can see that the song names are also now in Passamaquoddy uh, and they have uh, three, uh, they've decided to use three labels, the attribution label, the outreach label, outreach being that the Passamaquoddy have actively decided to be sharing this material. It's, a their, it's their decision, not some non-Indigenous uh, curator's decision about what's getting shared. Uh, and that this is non-commercial, that they don't want this material used in uh, commercial contexts in the future. So this is a significant change within um, the Library of Congress for these kinds of materials. But more than this, there was kind of some significant transformations that had to occur within the digital infrastructures themselves. And so if you understand histories of colonialism and think about the ways in which non-Indigenous people become authors and owners of Indigenous collections, those problems persist into the digital infrastructures where only the author is recognised uh, and Indigenous kind of names are left out of these digital infrastructures. So colonialism particularly is quite pernicious in within digital infrastructures. Um, this, required, this work required creating a subfield for the traditional knowledge labels that allowed for the recognition of Passamaquoddy rights within the actual mark record itself. It, it meant uh, creating a field for traditional knowledge labels within the entire um, uh, Library of Congress. And this means that now any Indigenous community that has traditional knowledge labels can add their labels into their content at the Library of Congress. That was a major infrastructural change that we were able to um, get through this project. And this is probably another really important component of it. This is within the rights advisory in the Library of Congress. And you can see that the traditional knowledge labels are there in the rights advisory. The rights advisory is largely usually kept for the copyright holder. And in this instance, this is the transformation in how these rights are recognized within the Library of Congress. You can see that there are still rights held by the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard University one might ask a question about how they hold those rights. But these rights for the Passamaquoddy are now the first rights. And that's another really important intervention um, that these labels have been able to do through a non-legal way, through an educational tool, but actually influencing and affecting the rights. This is also another really important component. This is within the Dublin core rights field for those of you who are interested in kind of um, uh, these particular kinds of uh, metadata frameworks. The labels have been added at the element of rights within the Dublin core rights field. And that's another really important dimension of change within the infrastructures themselves. 
So another component that we have been doing for the last um, year and a half is kind of extending the traditional knowledge labels into kind of more biocultural contexts. So contexts around genetic resources and particularly around the range of research that happens on indigenous lands and waters around um, genetic resources and genomic, resource, genomic science. So we've developed six, uh, of six new labels around provenance, uh, consent verified, open to collaboration, open to commercialization, multiple community and research use. You can see that some of those labels overlap with some of the ones that we developed for the traditional knowledge labels. This is an initiative largely coming out of Aetaroa, New Zealand, um, and a lot of uh, use cases are being developed there with communities in that context, though there's, a, there's several um, examples coming out of US, Australia context as well. And this is the provenance label It speaks to uh, some of the key uh, responsibilities that exist within the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that Indigenous people have the right to make decisions about the future use of information, biological collections, data and digital sequence information that derives from associated lands, waters and territories. And this label supports the practice of proper and appropriate acknowledgement into the future. So in many ways, one of the components about this project, which is a little bit different to the traditional knowledge project, traditional knowledge labels are really trying to get at a historical problem. They're trying to get at the enormous amounts of collections that are in archives and libraries that don't have Indigenous rights associated with them and don't have Indigenous names associated with them and don't have Indigenous authority. What we're afforded with the biocultural labels is, is to move this forward in a different kind of way so it, that in the future those mistakes aren't there anymore, that those mistakes are shifted and changed. So in, in, in a very kind of particular way, we're dealing with uh, problems around um, researcher practice and changing researcher practice, as well as changing practices within institutions, within universities, within libraries, within archives and with, within museums, and kind of establishing a different kind of standard for how to be working with Indigenous communities collaboratively and in partnerships. So this led us to develop the notice component of this kind of system. The notices are distinct intervention from the TK or BC labels, and they're really applied by researchers or institutions. They're not customizable. And the notice is really used as a placeholder on a collection or on data um, until a TK or BC label is added to replace it. In this way, it enables both institutions and researchers to act, to recognize indigenous rights in the very first instance of their research, not to hide them, not to er erase them, not to um, preclude them. Um, and the notices help identify Indigenous data and collections. And in that sense, they're, they're working to also start to make Indigenous data fair. We know that it's very difficult to find Indigenous data and Indigenous collections within institutions, museums and libraries. It's lifetimes of work to, um, to go and find those collections. Using these uh, notices is a kind of way of trying to get institutions, institutions and staff that are in institutions know what's in their collections. They can start making them visible to Indigenous communities in different ways and help in that process of reconnecting them back to Indigenous communities. So this is an example of the notices being used in an online catalogue at the Abbey Museum in Maine. Uh, this is uh, the Abbey Museum decided that they wanted to use the open to collaborate notice. The open to collaborate is really an indicator to the public and to the internal um, staff within an institution that the institution is actually willing to engage with different practices around collaboration um, with Indigenous communities. Again, indicating that they have thought about what that might mean and are actually actively having conversations about the change that that will require within their systems. So they've added open to collaborate to every single item within their online collection. And they've also added the, the notice attribution incomplete saying that they actually don't know what, is, what this item is. They really want to work with communities to add this information when it's appropriate. And so adding that um, attribution incomplete really signals to the Wabanaki communities that, they're, that there's where the kind of particular items are that need some help and need some support, but also that this needs to be done, uh, like that knowledge is only going to be shared through Wabanaki um, cultural forms and forms of authority. 
This is another example of the New York State Museum adding their um, open to collaborate notice to the Lewis Henry Morgan collection. This is the largest collection that the New York State um, Museum has uh, of Native American material. Again, you can see the repetition of the colonial logic that this collection is called the Lewis Henry Morgan collection, not the Indigenous communities names who are in this collection. So you can already see the challenges and what I'm talking about, about how particular kinds of problems within copyright law perpetuate themselves in the naming, in the very naming of the collections themselves. Um, and so this is kind of the system that we've been developing over the last um, 10 years to kind of really get at a very particular problem. Um, the labels don't work for everything, but they do a lot of work in elevating Indigenous authority and starting to kind of meet certain kinds of standards around um, Indigenous data sovereignty and making Indigenous data fair and findable and be part of how Indigenous materials can be properly governed through Indigenous frameworks of meaning. And so this is the kind of system that we develop with the labels, uh, which are distinct and for only for communities, and the notices, which are uh, a call to action for researchers and institutions to change their behaviour and to start acting in different ways. And I think on that note, I will end um, and hand over to my friend and colleague, Lisa Moorhead-Hillman. Lisa Moorhead Hillman, thank you so much for having me in this invitation. Um, I really appreciate all the remarks from each of the um, panelists and um, I would like to address a few of these. Um, so th a few things that kind of came out to me just talking about um, so the uh, inclusion of Native American voices. Um, when we um, so talk about um, including and uh, and uh, um, so deferring to a Native American cultures, it uh, is kind of like sticks in my throat thinking, oh, you're going to include me on, uh, so uh, on asking me about my culture. This goes, this is such a, uh, a pervasive way of thinking this. So kind of, you know, the, this sort of like, um, uh, patrological or so, uh, uh, patrimony, so this um, patronizing way of thinking about um, including um, so Native Americans. When uh, when I look, uh, for example, um, at um, some of the information that we have out there that our people have, you know, unfortunately given to a lot of people, or fortunately, however you want to, um, however you want to see that. Um, it's very difficult for me to get at that information, as for me to access that. Uh, an example here will be the Huntington Library, which has one of the the, the greatest holdings of um, of you know California, um, so intellectual property, California Indian, uh, so indigenous property, but um, but it's also in particular my own tribe, the Karuk tribe, and this is where I speak from. Um, is this I'm in the very heart um, of uh, of Karuk territory, which is over a million acres and we've been here um, since time immemorial. Um, I would also like to just jut in there that we have laws our own selves. We These laws predate uh, so uh, Western um, copyright trademark and it just it, it just uh, irks me to no end that that this is never um, never a topic that we don't say oh um, uh, Actually, let's listen to the laws that sh that uh, that really are authoritative on um, on uh, on Karuk, um, intellectual property. No, we're still trying to work within the framework of the United uh, so United States or Western intellectual property laws, which don't fit uh, so Native or in so many Indigenous uh, peoples uh, people's um, own works. So when I uh, when I'm talking about this hunting. Tin Library, the specific example is um, that I was trying to um, access some information there from a particular um, a collector, um, Grace Nicholson, who, and also Alfred Crover, who they amassed, you know, millions, I, uh, I, I really, so up to a million um, um, a material cultural objects we call them relations um, and also then the notes uh, about this so that's all these uh, th this kind of note taking uh, about how um, so pieces were acquired and a lot of those things show in the notes that they were taken inappropriately 
unfortunately. So, uh, so the, somehow people think that if they have, uh, you know, in a museum, a note that says, oh, this was purchased from Grace Nicholson, that shows that they are the owners of it. And it never ever questions how Grace Nicholson came to acquire those things. And again, going back to our, um, our own laws, you cannot just give away something from your family uh, or from your tribe that belong, that is a, a communal property, which unfortunately um, the United States uh, or Western uh, laws don't uh, recognize. So in the Huntington Library, there is, again, you know, a lot of information that I tried to um, access. And unfortunately, I only have a Master uh, of Arts degree, and that kind of is just not enough for the Huntington. Um, and it doesn't matter that I'm uh, so a Kodok tribal member at all. Um, actually, I need to be affiliated with a university or have, and also have a PhD, and I need to have, be invited to these things. Things. Otherwise, too bad. So I don't, I, I wasn't able to access anything uh, from the Huntington Library. In fact, we had to send a Brit, sorry, so for anyone who might be those, um, he, uh, who has a PhD, he was allowed to access information and, um, and luckily for us, he works for us and actually understands the prob problems uh, involved in accessing our own uh, cultural information. Uh, so had, um, had then, um, well, I better not even say this because then probably somebody from the Huntington will get uh, savvy onto this. Let me just say, so, so tell you that um, this last year for our world renewal ceremonies, we were able to uh, perform the first acorn ceremony, the first time in 140 years, because we were found information about that. And if you look on any of those kind of authoritative uh, uh, Western uh, kinds of uh, so, uh, documents talking about uh, Kodo culture, they will t tell you that women had nothing to do in ceremonies and that we never, uh, so we never performed any kind of uh, first acorn ceremony or anything uh, like that, that actually all we had to do was uh, cook and clean at ceremonies. Just, just saying, this information is so important for uh, so for present day uh, people such as myself who are um, who are trying very hard with their whole lives to practice um, and and uh, revitalize our cultural um, our, our culture material as well as uh, so the intellectual property driven songs and uh, stories that have their own uh, law laws um, connected to them um, I did want to also talk about about, um, the involvement, you know, and uh, understanding that, okay, um, a lot of these, um, this information in museums and, um, and archives and libraries don't have um, the actual participation of the tribes in question. Um, I just want to say, so be careful there, um, because I do, um, I'll tell you, for example, at the Peabody, uh, uh, where we went for a NAGPRA consultation, so where the NAGPRA uh, consult, uh, you know, what she wanted to have, what she saw uh, was the most uh, important things that she wanted from our visit. She never put the word, uh, so uh, returning, uh, repatriating in her mouth at all only that she wanted to have more participation from us that they could uh, so that they could populate um, the files of uh, of their uh, so um, their material culture from us that we would tell them more about that uh, those things so that their researchers uh, and students uh, would be able to have that information and she was so grateful for that information so I, I just be careful there as far as then, you know, the involvement, sometimes we don't want to tell you, we just want our things back. Um, then um, I so wanted to talk about um, one thing as far as, um, so asking, you know, uh, who do you ask? Um, who do you ask when um, you want to know or so know something about it or uh, you want them to tell you uh, what to do and whether or not you're actually culturally appropriating something or not? Um, there is um, some levels of, uh, level of difficulty.
Lisa, if I may, you went on mute for a second. Oh, okay. So how, how about now? That's great. We just lost like a sentence or so. Thank you. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, so I wanted to say um, we had um, so been to the um, uh, now it's going to uh, escape me. So in um, uh, so Southern California uh, in uh, Los Angeles, a, a very successful um, NAGPRA repatriation effort, one of the only ones that are actually we got. Um, so we got our relations back home. Um, we uh, there was a uh, an item there that we were trying to think about how we could put a label on it. So it's a traditional knowledge label so that you know, even in their archives of, um, of the, uh, some of the things that they've given back, how to, um, how to uh, address those, um, that item and who, to, uh, who is then the actual um, authority over that, um, that um, material culture. And it was, uh, it's a family, it belongs to a family. So there was a medicine woman, so who has had her uh, medicine dress there when she was just a little girl. So to, just a, Anyway, lovely piece. But this family, so I, we, you know, we could name the family, but then who in the family actually is, can be the representative, the authoritative representative? And then who in the tribes, are, are the tribes able to have an authoritative representative? So to, to say what things are. These are, there, there are so many levels um, of, of difficulty in, um, in, uh, in protecting our own intellectual property that is, completely unfunded. So, and I'll say the work that I've done for our tribe um, stemmed from, uh, so just reading uh, one of the research grants that, um, that I was working on, I recognized, wow, you know what? Um, all everything that we that we talk about and sh uh, and learn about and t so share with our university um, partners will now, belong to the university actually after this and it won't be our own uh, intellectual property anymore and this has happened i mean i've had um some people from berkeley so call and say ah we wanted to do this you know opera in the Karuk language and you know we'd really love it if you would you know to just say uh, how wonderful it is and kind of like sign off on it and we said no so no you can't take a uh, one of our traditional or uh, so origin stories out of context and so and do it somewhere else that's that's completely inappropriate and they returned with well we're going to do it anyway because we actually don't even need to ask you we were just being nice because um gifford collected that story and so it belongs to us there are many many layers of difficulties in protecting um intellectual property and uh, so again all the work that i've done so hours and hours for our tribe are Ours is just completely um, not the right word, but it was um, it was all on my own free time, and um, I don't I, I didn't have a way of being able to do that along with uh, everything else that I was actually getting paid to do um, in order to do it justice. So there, I feel that there's also there's. A, a problem in uh, in intellectual property protection in that uh, that you know in, in order to have our involvement and have um, have our participation have you uh, have us be able to tell you what it is that we want and need we do need to have uh, so someone or some people um, that are able to work on those things so I have so many things I could tell you, but I know I'm completely over time. So please, um, uh, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you so much, Lisa and Jane. And Lisa, you weren't over time at all. And in fact, we, I remember when we were doing one of the WIPO preparatory workshops and you joined us by phone and your words and stories just transported us and informed us so deeply that that was one of the reasons we wanted to invite you here and really to give you the last word, you know, to, to really, you know, share the significance from communities um, about some of these things, which really do go beyond the law and really go to a, such a long struggle for survival and recovery and flourishing today. So thank you for sharing those 
stories and experiences. Um, and I really appreciated, um, I do a lot of work with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is very insistent on Indigenous people's own laws, customs, and traditions when it comes to cultural and spiritual properties. And your reiteration that Indigenous peoples have their own laws. And in fact, that shouldn't just be the last point, but probably the beginning point for all of these conversations is um, really well taken. So thank you. And just thinking about your presentation in conjunction with Jane's, it's so important because um, I mean, I think Jane is talking about innovative solutions for labeling when materials remain in archives and those challenges that you've talked about in terms of access and treatment. And we know that so many indigenous, um, so much indigenous knowledge and in fact, ancestors are still in those archives or museums or universities. But then the ultimate point that that shouldn't be necessarily the ongoing disposition of those items, hopefully many of them will come home and they won't need to be labeled in any way in a university or in a, an archive. They will come to be embraced and treated the way that they're supposed to be um, at home. So thank you both for those really um, insightful presentations that are so deeply grounded in, in things that are really happening and not just in the courts. Um, or in distant places, but with uh, you know people in institutions that are um, deeply, uh, I don't want to say involved, but ha have deep stakes in, in these matters. So thank you so much. Um, and to all of you, there have been just so many uh, syntheses, syntheses between the presentations. I was thinking when Jane was talking about labeling and labeling for source and significance, um, there's almost nowhere more than the fashion industry where the label right connotes such value and how could labeling perhaps transform um, that world in a way that um, would produce more insights and also going back to the um, federal agencies whether some of those you know more uh, newer and innovations in describing the source and significance and so on of knowledge whether that could intersect with some of the um, programs that Ken and Susan talked about with respect to tribal marks and insignia and sort of getting tribes more involved in those programs too. Um, these are just my very initial reflections, but I, I thank you so much for the, the depth and breadth of what you've covered. We have many questions in the queue. And so with that, I'm going to turn um, the mic over to my close colleague Sue Noe at the Native American Rights Fund to moderate from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I just want to echo um, your comments and thanks to all our speakers today. It's been really fantastic information and I appreciate it so much. Uh, we do have a lot of questions and Kristen, you are wonderful at synthesizing questions. And so if you would like to jump in as well on some of these questions, because we do have quite a few. Um, but I'm going to start out and this is a question um, directed to Susan Scafidi. And it's, um, I think, related to your point about paying tribute. And so the paying part of paying tribute. So this, this question is, um, for some things, there's no compensation. So for example, the Zia um, sun symbol was once highly secret and sacred uh, on a single piece of pottery used by a small number of members. But it's now everywhere, of course, in New Mexico on the state flag. It's on the Capitol floor. Um, What's the remedy for a situation like that? And could there be some kind of repatriation or clawback of intangible um, cultural property like that? You know, I'd, I'd love to draw in Susan Anthony on this question as well because of the database that she uh, has, uh, has shepherded uh, so carefully for years. But at present, um, there, I, I don't know of a mechanism for taking back something that has been released into the public domain and has spread so widely, right? Um, and it would require, it's not that it's impossible, but it would require an act of political will, um, probably at the, at the state level in New Mexico or at the federal level to, to correct that and, and to, to roll it backwards. Um, 
and to, to restore that property to its original owners. And in that case, there is a, a pretty clear connection. It's not as though it is a symbol that does not have a clear origin, right? So, um, so unfortunately, right, we're limited in so many ways, uh, in, 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 as everyone has said, within the intellectual property system. In trademark, we're limited by the commerce requirement because the, the, the grounds of trademark are regulated by the, the commerce clause of the US Constitution. And so everything has to be used in commerce. In copyright and patent, we are limited by terms of years, which do not align with the, the terms of years thought of in, in generations and millennia uh, that, that we deal with when we're dealing with indigenous property. So that clawback could be constructed but it would have to be constructed out of, if you will, whole cloth in order to drive back. Does that does that help to answer the question? Um, I, I believe it was uh, the gentleman who was uh, uh, Preston Hardison um, who was asked a few in, in the in the chat as I was reading along. I think so. Um, Susan Anthony, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, um, my commendation to Susan Scafidi who. Um, certainly summed up uh, the situation uh, well. The one thing that I might add is people who are interested in this topic, which I guess is just about everybody on this uh, webinar, uh, should look at the Maasai um, and their efforts to get back their name uh, because of the uh, perceived uh, cultural misappropriation, if you will, of their name. And the tribe, along with um, at least one outside organization, maybe others, worked very hard to get back the Maasai name and to ensure respect, power, and undoubtedly compensation uh, for their rights going forward um, in connection with a number of um, advertisers of products who would use the Maasai name. You can certainly find that information easily on the internet if you simply look up Maasai, M-A-A-S-A-I, um, and um, trademark or name, you'll find the information there. These are very, very difficult questions, um, and certainly in the case of the Maasai, and certainly in many of the um, initiatives we've discussed, these are extra legal um, actions, if you will, to try to do something that the United States law doesn't seem to do in most cases. Thank you. Um, another question, we have, or, or some of, several of the questions, um, deal with um, language issues. And so, for example, one question, um, pursuant to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, can a tribe stop an Indian, a non-Indian owned company from using that tribe's language to promote and name its products? And then there was also another question about the Aloha Pokey case where, um, you know, a Chicago, I believe, corporation um, trademarked that and then um, went after um, Native Hawaiian um, owned businesses um, with cease and desist letters um, to prevent them from using that term. So um, yeah, so I just want to put that question out there. What um, Indian Arts and Crafts Act or any other law um, is there available for tribes to protect the use of their language? I, I might have jumped the gun and already responded to that in writing to, to the questioner. But uh, I mean, that would really, for, from the Arts and Crafts Board perspective, yeah, that would really you'd need to look at it on a case by case basis. It's there's no broad answer to that. Uh, as far as Native Hawaiians, that's not covered under the Act currently. Though there have been a couple efforts to do amendments in the past that, that might have incorporated that, but uh, they did not go through. Sue, so if I may, just on that point, um, I mean, my sense is that U.S. law is very undeveloped with respect to protections for indigenous peoples' languages. And we have the Esther Martinez Language Protection and Revitalization Act, but that's really about 
grants for language teaching and incredibly important and totally insufficient, but we need an entire regime for restoring, revitalizing, and protecting indigenous people's languages. As Lisa was mentioning, um, you know, sometimes your own language is held by some other, <laughs> you know, institution actually owns all of the written products associated with your language that you're trying to then learn and recover in community. And um, 2022 is the start of the United Nations International Decade on Indigenous Peoples Languages. And there are two articles, again, in the Declaration that talk about Indigenous Peoples' rights to use um, and revitalize their own languages as Articles 13 and 14. And I think that we could think of um, a legislative agenda, a regulatory agenda, and most importantly, actions in tribal communities to um, surface their own laws, customs, and traditions about language to really better capture and protect some of these um, points because language does go to identity. It is a source identifier. It's all of these things that we're talking about, but I, but I don't think of many places in U.S. where any of that is recognized. So thank you. In, in very strictly narrowly legal terms, I would say, for example, in the Aloha Poke case, we have uh, prior users, right? Um, and so we have senior users, even if they're not registered, who have some rights to continue. I also like the, the, the idea of playing with the flexibility of false designation of origin, right? Uh, because it, it is, of course, in the United States, when I was a kid, we drank something called Hawaiian punch and everyone knew it wasn't from Hawaii. And therefore, because there was no consumer confusion, that wasn't shut down. But if we are, if we do have a circumstance where the use of a particular recognizable term in, in, a, in an indigenous language does lead to an association in the consumer's mind with that, with that community, we might argue that there is a false designation of origin, uh, not necessarily because we're using a geographical term, but because again, we're pointing in that direction. So it's a flexible way of trying to interpret it, but at least it's a way of starting to think about how we can find the elasticity in the limited amount of law that we do have in the US. Uh, and this is Susan Anthony. I wanted to comment also on the Aloha Poke case. Uh, all I know, I just I read from the press, but uh, one of the concerns that I had was that the Hawaiian businesses appeared to believe that they did not have trademarks and they must have been under the mistaken impression. They're in good company. A lot of, of small businesses think this, that if they have not registered their trademark, they do not have a trademark. But in fact, they have common law rights in the mark. And if they were in fact, uh, a senior users of the mark or similar mark, uh, then they could challenge the registration of the mark at the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, to my knowledge, no such challenge uh, was or has been filed, but I did want to point out that there was um, an unfortunate, it appeared to be general perception by these Hawaiian businesses that they did not have trademarks when in fact the restaurants did. Now, whether those trademarks would be the basis for challenge, I have no idea. Also, I wanted to mention that in the record of the registration by the Chicago company, the word poke is disclaimed, meaning that it remains available for anybody uh, to use. Well, that's excellent information. Thank you um, so much um, for those responses. I think it's, it, you know, that's something that we're really hoping to um, have come out of these webinars is for um, folks to understand that even though the Western or conventional intellectual property system may not be a good fit, maybe there, of course, are other ways, other avenues, um, other ways to um, to look at the laws and um, and to try to deal with these kinds of issues and some ways that are non-legal um, ways. Um, um, okay, the next question I have is for Professor Anderson. Um, what's the process for correcting institutional museum or library records that may exist pertaining to ancient native peoples and or peoples who, whose culture didn't survive European contact? 
you have a response on that? Uh, I don't, don't really have a response to that. I mean, the, this initiative is really for um, working with present day communities and recognizing the authority that those communities have over those collections now. Um, and in many ways, this work is, is really trying to pull out and make visible those always existing authority that are still within these collections. And in making that visible, also creating a pathway for return. One of the biggest challenges that we have, particularly within archives, libraries and museums is kind of what Indigenous scholar Eileen Morton Robinson would describe that settler colonial whiteness is about possession, possession of Indigenous lands and possession of Indigenous knowledges. And part of that possession is erasing the names and erasing the authority. And part of the, what the labels is trying to do is to make that visible so that people can then say, okay, this is our material. We want this back, as Lisa rightly says. Um, and, you know, but there are multiple strategies that are required to get to that point. And this isn't the only one, but it is one um, that we've developed to kind of address some of those problems. Um, and I think another question in there was about enforcement. And because this is a kind of educative or kind of extra legal in the sense that it um, doesn't have the authority of uh, current existing law with it, it's not really about enforcement. It's, it's really kind of trying to deal and reckon with the histories that lead to these problems in the first place. Um, and unless we reckon with those, we're gonna repeat them. Uh, and so I feel like very strongly that this is not about what, what, how do you enforce it? It's, it's, it's really, how do you kind of move these kinds of questions in a way that get a reflection that the law isn't actually going to solve all these problems because the law actually produced some of these problems, many of them, in fact. And so having that reckoning is a really important thing about how we develop any strategies that can get at that problem really from a community standpoint. Thank you. And I know, um, Professor Anderson, you mentioned that you have some trainings that are um, that you'll also be doing. And I wondered if you wanted to mention something about those trainings. Oh, thanks, Sue. Yeah, we um, are very uh, happy to announce that we received this um, Institute for Museum Library Services grant uh, officially yesterday uh, to provide intellectual property and indigenous data sovereignty and governance training to uh, 60 tribes over the next three years uh, in Alaska, um, within Arizona and within the Eastern States. So if you are interested in those or you, you're a community member who knows that your community could benefit from some of that training, it's a five day intensive training, um, please feel free to reach out to either me, it's also being run with the Penobscot Nation in Maine and also the Native Nations Institute in, um, in uh, University of Arizona. Like a wonderful um, Susan Anthony, did you want to speak? Uh, yes, I did. I, I saw that uh, Lisa had posed a very interesting question in in the chat, and I wanted to make sure that we we got it. Fortunately, it's not a question for Susan A. It's a question for Susan S. And uh, Lisa has asked, how do you protect basket designs from firms like Urban Outfitters? Uh, when these basket designs belong to other tribes as well. Many of the basket designs, she says, uh, are shared with neighboring tribes. That, that is an, an, an enormous problem uh, because, uh, and I, I wonder if Ken could weigh in on it as well, but as Ken noted, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is all about words. It's not about designs, it's not about images. Um, and, and so it's very limited in that regard. Had Urban Outfitters just said, hey, these are Southwestern designs, that would have been it. There would have been no cause of action. Um, and so it is a real problem. So we have first, first the problem of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act being focused on words, not images, or words, not designs. And then we have the additional problem of, of course, Western intellectual property law, copyright and patent, being focusing on what is new and novel um, and wanting to identify the genius author or inventor, the individual. It's not about communal creation. And because it's not about communal creation, 
question, it can't even really uh, encompass an unincorporated, uh, open, uh, not not clearly defined community of uh, one community of individuals. Never mind several communities that may share similar heritage. So again, we're back to the problem of really bad fit. Um, if we could get past the, the the question of being unable to protect designs in perpetuity when they have some special cultural meaning, um, uh, then we could we could move from there to to work backwards to and to whom do they belong and who and who should have this and who should have the, uh, the say over um, uh, over how they should be used. Um, but it's really a twofold problem. Um, and and while I've got the mic, just thank you. For, 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 your, for sharing what you shared in your wonderful words. Um, we, we have so much work to do and we know it, but it helps to hear it. Um, but Ken, um, from the, I, the uh, Indian Arts and Crafts Act perspective, anything to add? Any, uh, anything yeah. you can find? I, I think I'm gonna point over and say what, what Susan said, <laughs> uh, except uh, I, I would say speaking more, more in my, my role as Ken person, rather than as a representative of the Arts and Crafts Board, that a situation like this, it's an excellent opportunity for all of the stakeholders to coordinate, to establish lines of communication, and to try and draw that line in the sand for themselves with the tools that they've got. Whether it's just uh, claiming the higher ground of having that cultural authority and organizing a way to, to represent that you have that, so that, there, as, as Susan had pointed out too, the First Amendment is going to interfere with a, a lot of attempts to stop people from expressing something or using a theme in, in a work or any number of things that all, all the tools I deal with have to do with, with commercialism and with trade, but certainly there, there is room in the, the public arena for organizations and, and groups to speak out on these issues and to just try and take that territory back. To create a concept of authenticity um, and a designation of authenticity and then go take that to the next step to publicity um, and to make sure that that can get out there through the media, through social media. <laughs> mechanisms of social change um, rather than legal change. And social norms, I think of as a form of law, right? We have social norms that tend to run ahead of black letter law. If we can change the social norms, the law might follow. And I just wanted to make a, a pitch again for the branding initiative that Ken and I talked about earlier because I think that really could be a good fit in this situation. If the neighboring tribes were to come together to form a collective, an organization, and then to develop a certification mark in which there would be standards under which the baskets are made. And then as Susan Scafidi was just saying, uh, the, the baskets are further promoted. Now I'm assuming that the baskets are uh, are, are made, at least some of them are made to be sold. And uh, obviously when Ken and I have been talking about the branding initiative, uh, we were assuming that there's an interest as there, as there was, is with the Kenyan basket makers of uh, commercializing, of growing their economic development and their sale of the baskets. I do not mean to suggest that that is what people desire in all cases. I appreciate that there are not. Um, also, Ken and I were talking yesterday about where tribes uh, within a tribe or with another tribe between tribes have a, have a dispute that uh, mediation may be an appropriate means to try to resolve those disputes. That's the subject of an entirely new webinar, <laughs> Uh, I did want to mention that too in passing. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to turn back to Lisa Moorhead Hillman again. Um, and Lisa, it's wonderful to see you. I appreciated so much all the great information you and Jean and others shared with me when I was uh, preparing for a presentation that I did on, on some of these issues a couple of years ago. Um, 
I really appreciate your discussion about um, Indigenous peoples' own laws, um, tribes having their own laws and protocols, and of course, all the work that Karuk has done uh, related to that, that, that I learned about through you. Um, and just again, uh, if you could talk a bit more about the role and importance of those laws in, in issues like this and what we, um, you know, folks inside or outside communities can do to help support um, the applicability of tribes own laws and re recognition and respect for those laws. Thank you, Sue, for the question. Um, and it's uh, a great one because, uh, so frankly, I don't know. Uh, so I have, we have um, written several policies and, um, and one of them, so I, I wanted to mention because um, uh, you know, in doing so, writing policy and uh, in in putting uh, together protocols, we've uh, we've um, we've made it a, the practice to um, to bring these um, these policies and so writings forth to our uh, to a group of people that represent something. Okay, so there's elders, there's uh, students, there's young people, there's families, there are researchers in all kinds of different sort of end users, so to speak. And in, um, in, and in doing so, uh, we have um, like made some pretty, you know, bold statements in saying, you know, these um, the intellectual property has been uh, appropriated time and time again, and this is been happening for since you know contact and we uh our goal is to have get our stuff back um so just and get it back and whether how we do that so it doesn't matter we're going to get it back and I, i'll say you know so to some of these you know our elders they were you know uh, my mom was among them, and she's very a timid person. And and you know, they're those um, you know that generation are either the children of people um, that have been to boarding school. All my grandparents had to go to boarding school, or they are were um, boarding school um, so students themselves. Which you know, I think if you some of you may know that that's been a place where so really uh, people were uh, our people are really knocked down and made um so trying you know just to um just to be a part or culturate is the main uh thing and those um elders you know they when reading some of those bold statements said what what can we say that are, 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 can we really say that and and this is something I think is uh, really, you know, my husband's forte. He's, he was leading those uh, those uh, that, those efforts. Said yes, well, you know, we should say those things. Why can't we say those things? You know, is we're the authority of, of our own things, and and they said, okay, let's say that. Let, let, let's say that and and it was really in a, a moment of that uh, wrought with so much emotion to have our own elders who have said time and time again you need to you need to and you can't say that and you got to be nice be the nice indian try and be nice you know so this is this is really something very powerful so in order to so to help us so you know to go on to that again kind of patronizing sort of like thing we, and we do need help no question i'm um i'm i'm saying you know we need support for that kind of um that kind of um um so feeling of yes we can yes we are you know what we can uh, because we are that would be helpful another um so a piece of that where i saying i don't know um we have um talked with a lot of uh, people, so laid out a, so practicing PIKYAV policy, PIKYAV meaning to fix it, and that's our word for like fixing things or renewing things or revitalizing, making them better or making them good. Um, that's the literal translation. Um, so those, um, we, uh, you know, we've, since we've put them into a policy form and then uh, so had, you know, our ongoing researchers coming in to ask about um, our, you know, traditional knowledge, especially environmental, um, so traditional environmental knowledge or ecological knowledge. Um, there, um, you know, we've said, okay, you know, uh, that's fine, you work with us, but then there is, you know, you aren't allowed to say any of this thing, uh, anything, uh, share this unless, you know, we've given you uh, permission. And if we don't like what you have written, we will say, no, you can't publish it. And this has been something where, you know, a lot of researchers are like, wow, 
yeah, we, we, we can't do that. You know, I, uh, this is my PhD. This is my, 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 anyway. You can understand what I'm saying here, um, but we have had, you know, some people turn away and, but most people said, no, yeah, you, it belongs to you. And I, I, I want you to be the owners of this and I want you to share um, authorship. You know, I want you to be the first listed, you know, as Karuk tribe rather than Lisa Moorhead Hillman. You know, it's, it's not my personal knowledge. It's my, my, my people's knowledge that I'm sharing. Um, but uh, I, I have, you know, just coming to the idea of, okay, what happens if, um, whether it's, you know, researchers or, or videographers um, coming in to, you know, and filming something, what happens if they do publish without prior permission? Now, that's, uh, so as far as I, you know, my work, it's never been tested and we've never gone to court saying, yeah, okay, I'm going to sue your ass. So anyway, anyway, I just had to bring some kind of word in there. So you get, so this makes this real, but um, I, I don't know where we stand on that and how, uh, how that would stand up in court. Well, thank you so much for those very powerful words. And um, I love that. It's so inspiring and, um, you know, really calls to mind um, things like, oh, that uh, Navajo is now generic and uh, now your work is in the public domain. Says who? Says who? Who, who do these things belong to and who has the authority um, to make decisions about about things like that. So really, really appreciate that. Um, I see that we are coming up uh, very quickly on the end of our time. I just want to thank everyone again so much uh, for your wonderful presentations. We have an, you know, quite a few questions that didn't get answered. And I'm hoping there's some way that our technical people can capture those for us um, so that we can um, you know, continue to work with those questions and, and possibly look at what, um, what more we could do in the future in terms of other webinars and things like that, what issues um, maybe need some more, more time and, and discussion in this kind of format. So again, just wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank Kristen Carpenter and everyone at CU Law School who's worked on um, helping to make these um, webinars possible. And yeah, just appreciate all your work and all your, your words today. Thank you for sharing. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Kristen for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and thank you to all of the presenters. I feel like we came together in such a nice dialogue and I'm hopeful that um, we, along with all of the people out there watching, can really engage together to work on the protection of indigenous people's own traditional knowledge and cultural expressions um, toward the true revitalization and healing. And as Lisa said, um, making it good going forward. So um, thank you again. We'll be posting this recording. Thank you for sharing your expertise and experience. And as Sue Noe says, we may reconvene again. Um, the University of Colorado always enjoys working with the Native American Rights Fund and National Congress of American Indians to bring together our academic and practical experiences in this field. So thank you all. Take care. Have a great day. Um, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.